Hello everyone. Welcome to our talk. Uh, we'll talk about developer first Gradle builds today. Uh, and we'll go over these few topics. We'll start with the, the challenges we face with maintaining and understanding Gradle builds. Uh, we'll talk about our vision of developer first builds, declarative Gradle, so to speak, and its current state. We'll show you some demos, live demos, and talk a little bit about uh, what's next. So I'm Paul, and I'm here with my colleague Sterling, engineers in the Gradle build tool team. We're part of the Gradle company. Our mission is to make you productive. And day-to-day, uh, -day we work on the Gradle build tool. Uh, our company also has a commercial product, Develocity, which is the first uh, developer productivity engineering integrated solution. And its um, prominent feature is Build scans. I don't know if you heard about it. The idea is to record a permanent, uh, to store a permanent record of every build uh, you do, so you can troubleshoot these things easily. And our company coined the term "developer productivity engineering" a few years back. We have a few books, shows, and a conference about it. And we launched yesterday the Developer Productivity Engineering University with. Um, self-service online courses around Gradle, Develocity, and Maven. Um, and with that introduction done, I will leave that to my colleague Sterling. Okay. Good morning. Um, so I'd like to talk about some of the challenges uh, that we face with Gradle. Um, as you know, Gradle is a very flexible and extensible build system that comes with some drawbacks. Um, build scripts can sometimes speak Gradle and not your domain. Um, build scripts can evolve into a mess if you aren't diligent about it. And tooling can really only help you so much uh, to maintain and, and, and get out of that. Um, so yeah, here's an example of uh, a build script. This is actually generated from our, uh, our build in it. Um, and you look at this and you go, OK, you know, I can maybe understand some things here, but um, you know, I'm a software developer, you know, I've heard of Maven Central, I've heard of dependencies, I've heard of tests. I use JUnit 5, I guess that's maybe similar to JUnit Platform. Um, I'm not sure why the dependencies look different here, but you know, maybe that's meaningful in some way. Um, I'm using Java, it, was, maybe it should have been Kotlin, I should have updated that. Um, I'm using Java, but what kind of Java am I making? Am I making a library, am I making an application? I don't know, like, this doesn't tell me that. Um, and you get situations like this where build scripts evolve over time and they start applying things from other places and they have plugins coming from other places. They duplicate some things maybe. They add 500 lines, you know, that are missing from here. Uh, kind of bad practices seep into this. And it's like, how do I, you know, how do I keep up with this? Um, and so you think about toolability, but there's kind of a, uh, a really high bar for tools to uh, make sense of the build file and uh, try to make updates to it. You know, if you were to say, okay, I want to have a tool that will add a dependency in the right place. It's like, where is the right place in here? Like, what does it need to look like? Um, there's conditional logic in here. There's like custom functions. There's loops. Where do you go? Where, what, what, what do you do about that? Um, so it's really, really hard for tools. Um, so I have a question, a couple of questions. Just raise your hand. Um, who's needed a flexible and extensible build system in, in their lives? Almost everybody, half of people maybe. Um, but who's seen a complex build? <laughs> Good. Much more. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, today, like, what, what can you do to overcome these challenges? Um, you know, we, we have, let me, let me give you some definitions first. Um, talk about a software definition. This is like, what do you want to build? Um, 
you know, I'm building a library, I'm using Kotlin, I'm using some other language because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I have certain targets, certain platforms, those sort of things, uh, and dependencies. And then there's uh, build logic. These are how the software is going to be built. These are like new capabilities I want to do or I want to add to it. These are integrations I want to have with the build, pr the build process with something else. Um, I want to pr provide conventions for my software definition so I don't have to have, as a software developer, I don't have to specify everything. I just get some, some conventions, some uh, default values. Um, so like our recommendations have been for a long time to try to make your uh, build scripts look declarative. Um, keep your build logic in plugins. Um, give your convention plugins meaningful names so that it makes sense when someone looks at the build file like, oh, this is my, these are my um, uh, back-end library conventions or something. Um, and then keep your build scripts really simple. Like you, no conditions, no loops, just try to keep them uh, almost as data. Uh, and so it might look something like this. You know, I apply a plugin. It's got a meaningful name. I've got some dependencies. They're very regular looking. They're very simple looking. Um, but, but this might not be enough, is what we think now. Um, there's nothing that stops it from kind of backsliding into some of the other slides I was just showing, where you know, bad practices creep in or toolability kind of breaks down because it's, it's still, you know, it's just, like, uh, it's just Kotlin, right? It's just, a, it's just a programming language in the end, so. Yeah, so with, with this acknowledge, um, we, our, our mission statement has always been to provide an elegant and extensible declarative build language that allows developers to describe any kind of software in a clear and understandable way. We are not there yet, right? Gradle is extensible and flexible, sure. You can have declarative builds, but like Sterling said, there's no enforcement that your build stays declarative. You, have, you still have the freedom, so you can mess it up. And, and it's not perfect in that. And all this makes builds not so clear, not so understandable. Like when a software developer goes from one project to another, you can see that the two builds could be really different even if they are doing the exact same thing. And that's not clear and understandable. So this boils down to two roles uh, we, we all have. Uh, being a software developer, we ship features, we fix bugs in software. And it's the majority of people in most teams. On the other side, the build engineers, their job is to maintain the build and make the developers productive. In larger teams, it's frequent that some people have only that role. But in a lot of, lot of teams, the same person has to change hats sometimes and be a build engineer for a couple of days, then go back to his software developer role. And in, in small teams, it's very frequent that once there is a gradle problem and someone uh, pull it off, like fix it. Uh, the others tell, oh, that's the gravel expert. I'm going to ask you. And this, this is not good for developer productivity in general. So coming back to this distinction between the software definition and the build logic that Sunning said. Software definition is what needs to be built, and that part is really meant to be read and modified by software developers. And that, as of today, already this resides in settings and the project definition, the build.grill files and settings files. And the build logic, on the other hand, like how, are meant to be read and modified by build engineers. And this resides in plugins. The plugins can be local or, or, or external. And so, to make developer builds uh, first class, our goals are as follows. The first one is to split uh, these two with a clear boundary by basically putting a fence between these two worlds. And this fence is a declarative DSL. So the build definition can only be declarative, like not, not a Turing complete language. The second one is to match the software definition to software domain. 
So the idea is to like raise the abstraction and have more modeled um, configuration option for the software developer that makes sense for a software developer. And with that, we want to have like excellent ID integration and tooling. So we will show you a little bit of where we are. We've been working on this for half a year. Uh, a few teams are involved uh, at Grill. We have one team dedicated to the DSL, one team dedicated to the software modeling, and one team to the ID integration. We work together with the Android Studio team at Google, prototyping uh, ID support, and we also uh, work with uh, IntelliJ, Kotlin, and Ampere teams at JetBrains. Um, a few disclaimers about what you will see. This is all experimental. This is all based on nightlies, nothing released. Uh, we're changing stuff all the time. Everything breaks every other day. So it's not ready for production use. Um, so the, the configuration language uh, we came up with is purely declarative, meaning not Turing complete, no flow control, uh, there is only one way to do one thing, and it's a tiny, tiny subset of the Kotlin language. So the syntax is very familiar, and it, it leverages the expressiveness of Kotlin, so you can have, you, it's declarative, but you can still have like beautiful um, build definitions. And because it's a tiny, tiny subset of the Kotlin language, we were able to um, build up a, a fast parser, and a resilient parser, thanks to um, a clear syntax. We will explain a little bit more about the resiliency. And the, the language is built around uh, schemas and documents, just a bit like XML. Shh, never, nobody said that. Um, so, so getting to the tooling, um, we have the, the Gradle Tooling API is an API that uh, tooling integrators use today. It's basically a client, uh, a, a GVM API, a uh, client to the daemon, the Gradle daemon, and it also allows the IDE to query um, and interact with the Gradle daemon to like extract information, run tasks, etc. And we, we are extending this tooling API so you can get the schemas for all the software definitions that are available, uh, and this can be done without configuring any projects already today, and we're planning to make that faster, but it's already much faster than it was before. And then you can load uh, all the project definitions uh, as documents, and we have a DOM-like API around it, and this is data, so we can serialize all this to JSON, it's like very easy to understand. So if you performance numbers here. Um, this diagram shows uh, the number of seconds, so yeah, it's a lot, uh, to run Gradlu Assemble on a 500 project builds on a fresh machine. So it's like, it's not a clean build, it's like a clean machine. There's nothing there. So it needs to like populate every cache, etc. So we see that with the Kotlin DSL, we are a bit more than a minute, the Groovy DSL half a minute, and the declarative DSL we get to a, a dozen seconds. Uh, this is to be taken with a grain of salt because uh, we will make things slower by adding features, but we did not optimize anything yet, and we know we have a lot of room for improvements, but it, it, it sets a ballpark. Yeah, and so talking about other parts of the uh, current prototype, um, we've set software definitions, or We've set up software types for uh, several different ecosystems. So these software types are kind of the high-level model that you can configure um, for the ecosystem in your uh, project files. Um, the prototypes wrap around the existing plugins, so AGP and, and uh, KMP. Um, the software types right now, the, the models themselves are pretty limited, just sort of enough that we can explore setting different things of different types and, 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 and patterns. Um, and one of the big things you'll see when we get to the demos um, is in these project DCL files, there's no plugin application. There's no plugin block. There's nothing like that. Um, the, way, the way it works is, you know, what your project says your uh, software type is, 
that dictates what plugins get applied. Um, the other thing that uh, you'll see in the, in the demo coming up, um, in the current prototypes we have something we, we're calling reusable conventions. Uh, these are conventions that uh, you use to share common configuration across projects. Um, and they go in this top level settings file. They let you set some properties, some dependencies. It looks kind of like regular uh, build script stuff. Um, but you don't have to have like a separate plugin. You don't have to put this in with your build logic. This all lives kind of in the software developer's domain uh, in their project files and their settings files. Um, so this is what, this is very, very pared down so you don't get distracted by anything else. Um, uh, in settings, we have new, a new settings.gradle.dcl, you know, settings declarative configuration language, um, where you can set conventions for a software type. So this Kotlin JVM library is a, a software type. Um, and then in the project file, we're not applying any plugins. Uh, we're just saying this project is a Kotlin JVM library. Uh, and then we can set some extra settings uh, in there. Uh, and we inherit the conventions from the settings file. Um, OK. So demos. And we're going to switch over here. All right. So do we want to make it any bigger? Is good? Yeah. I think it's fine. Yeah, that's fine. No, yeah. let's make it a big, big. OK. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is the uh, now, an Am now an Android project. Uh, so we've been using this as our, our guinea pig to start, you know, taking a real project and, and converting it into um, uh, using declarative files. Uh, so the settings file has been converted uh, into a declarative file. You'll see this is the only place where plugins can be applied. Is at the settings level, uh, and this is our prototype plugin that adds software types for the Android ecosystem. So it adds a Android library and Android application software type. Um, and so then we can set some conventions for, for our Android libraries. Um, so what's being set here, not that interesting, but uh, we can um, set the, you know, the, SDK, the compile SDK version, add some dependencies, turn on some serialization. So what this means is any other project that says it's an Android library, these are the conventions that it, it starts out with. Um, so then in this other project, we have, um, uh, this is the core common uh, subproject. Uh, we say we're an Android library, this is our namespace, um, we, set, we add some testing dependencies in here, uh, and then we also say we're using Hilt. Uh, Hilt doesn't have any extra configurations, it's just an empty block. Um, and so this, this does everything, this doesn't, um, you don't have to apply any plugins because the Android library software type implies that the AGP plugin gets applied uh, and you get conventions from settings. So if I run this and everything goes right, um, I can just click the button. Um, everything is still, it's, all, all that's interesting here is it's, it's successful. And if I say, okay, let me break the build by removing this, uh, um, this uh, Hilt convention, or Hilt, Hilt, Hilt configuration. This removes Hilt from my Android library configuration, and sort of turns it off, and if I run it now, uh, the build will hopefully fail. It fails because there's stuff that didn't get generated for um, Dagger and that sort of thing. So if I put it back, everything should be back again. Um, and then I can look at, okay, um, what can I do in this file, right? It looks, it looks a lot like Kotlin. Um, that's in, by design, that's by intention, or, or, or it's intentional. Um, what we want to be able to do is, uh, as people like transition to this, they'll be able to configure the same DSL in a KTS file to start with. Um, and then once they get to kind of like, okay, we're declarative enough, they can just like rename their file to DCL and they get all the same, same goodness. Or if you're going the other way, like, oh, this is, I need a little bit of configurability for I'm experimenting or, or whatever, you can sort of go back the other way as well. Um, so there's, it's limited right now, but we have, um, hell is another person's keyboard. Um, uh, we have some autocomplete in here, so you can, I can come in and set um, 
a different JDK version, so I think it's it's 11 at the top. And if I do this, it should it should fail as well. Um, it doesn't it doesn't like it. Um, and if I go and I can remove it again, um, everything's successful again. Yeah. Um, but this also works if I go up at the, at the settings level. I can also change things here. Um, and when I run it again, it also fails. So you can see that it's it's all kind of connected together. Um, yeah, the, the GDK, GDK, GDK version in the conventions are applied to all sub-projects that use, that software use the Android library software type, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, so you may look at this and go, well, the, the, you know, what's the relationship between uh, this and and um, and Amper, right? Um, and we think you know Amper is an experiment with very similar goals, um, but uh, what we think is that um, we're, we're confident that with our, our, our vision that we can uh, get the same kind of uh, focus on software developer productivity and uh, kind of maintain the all the good things about Gradle. Uh, with flexibility and extensibility and scalability um, to the point that you know you wouldn't you wouldn't have to have uh, amper um, but it's all experiments we'll see how things go um, so let me turn it over to you so the, this is the the state of uh, the ID integration we have in in studio that we built together with the Android team uh, and I wanted to show something else uh, about the, the toolability of this. So this is uh, uh, an application that runs as a Gradle client. So it uses the GVM uh, tooling API to interact with the, the Gradle daemon and with Gradle in general. Uh, you might have noticed that it's a uh, Compose uh, desktop. Uh, here you can see uh, two builds that uh, we can connect to. And now we're, we're connected to the now in Android we, we just saw. And there are some, uh, yeah, it's small, that's it. Um, we can connect to the build and query for some build environments. We can query the build for information about the models. That's, that's vanilla Gradle stuff. And it doesn't show much, but this is to see that this guy is pretty quick because it queries things only about the build layout. So it doesn't need to configure the projects. It just needs to configure settings. This one, on the other hand, needs to configure all the projects. Um, when an ID uh, syncs, for example, uh, with a project, it needs to do that, configure the project, and do much more. And it's, it's slower. So, okay, so that, that's vanilla griddle. Now, now let's look at these two, which are about the, our declarative prototype. This one queries for the schemas we discussed earlier. So you can see here that in the now in Android build, I have two software types available. And for each one, I can see this is the schema. This is basically what all the possible properties that are configurable there. And so any tool can like reflect on this and then in instrument the, the build files and stuff like that. Uh, and then this one takes not much more time, but it loaded the, um, the definition for all the projects. Uh, and on the right, it's the same build script as we were looking at before. We can look at others if we want, like the, all the, the ones we converted. And this is the source on the right, and on the left we have um, the data populated from the definition and matched it and validated with the schema. And you can see here that we can uh, we can like click blocks, and we know we know where things are declared. And this is this is a good building block for tooling, like for ID support and and automated refactorings and, and stuff like that. Um, I will show you just another build we have, 
where we show all the um, unified how the daemon was dead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and here we, we see it, it's our test bed project where we, we're trying to model more, more software types and figure out all the use cases we need. And so we have like a few GVM, Android, Kotlin, Swift things. And you can see that in the same way we have all the, the document there. Like if we look at, uh, I don't know, the Kotlin app, we have like the, the targets and, and stuff like that. All right. So uh, after showing this to you, a few questions. Who in this room in this room tried already to like script automate changing build scripts? Yeah, not a lot. I guess it's because it's it's tough. <laughs> um, and so what I just showed is is read only UI for now, but with some love it could be used to um, like help you understand what a bill is about. And w would you like to use a UI to like understand what a bill is about and even modify it? Oh yeah, some interest. All right, so that, that was where we, where we are now. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit where, what we're doing next. So the, this tooling, the toolability aspect of, of all this, allows us to build, uh, and we're building, a mutation framework to, to provide refactoring abilities. And the idea is to have like Gradle-guided changes where um, you can use from the tooling for an IDE, any script or a command line uh, that will ask you questions and apply refactorings to, to the build. And uh, we're building this with IDEs in mind so it can support the regular workflow with the preview diff and, and undo and, and everything. And we will provide mutations out of the box by Gradle and some could be registered by, by plugins. Some examples are like upgrading an external dependency. That's the most basic thing a software developer wants to do. But it can be more, more semantic, more, more high-level mutations like adding Compose to my project or adding Kotlin serialization or stuff like that, adding Room. Or and this framework can be used for upgrading uh, and automa automating upgrades, like upgrading Gradle from 9 to 9.1 and refactor the project to use non-deprecated properties, right? So you don't have to do it by hand. Another thing we are looking at is to make the ID sync uh, much faster and resilient. Because today, today it's a monolithic thing. Like either sync works or it doesn't. And when it fails, the ID cannot help you so much. So what we want to do is to be able to pro progressively provide more context to the IDE so it can like already provide you uh, not a complete context, but something that can help you fix what's wrong instead of doing this in a, in a big step. And because uh, parsing and reparsing declarative file is fast, this makes it much faster when you change uh, the bill logic as a bill engineer. Um, and Back to the resiliency aspect of the, the parser we came up with. Um, a typo in a script today is a fatal error for, for sync. And that, that, that's a pain for software developers. Uh, but they don't have to be fatal. Like we, we can do a best effort to provide a context to the IDE that is almost complete, so the IDE can still be, be helpful. Um, and so we, we said we're working with uh, JetBrains and Google for the support in, in uh, their IDEs, but our IDE team is also exploring uh, language server and build server protocols 
So we can, uh, and we plan to provide plugins for both Eclipse build chip and uh, Visual Studio Code, but that could be used for a lot of other IDEs like Emacs or VI, if you're into that kind of thing. NetBeans. NetBeans. Yeah. Um, so some other things that we're looking for, uh, are looking at next, um, is being able to make it easier to define new software types. Um, it's very common for a project or a build to have maybe multiple conventions for the same kind of project. You have different types of Android libraries, different types of Kotlin libraries. Um, and in some cases, you may want to restrict the configurability of a software type. Like you only want you know, the namespace to be configurable. You only want these dependencies to be configurable and not everything else. Um, and then there's like entirely new ecosystems and, and, and software types that we want people to be able to develop. So um, a multiple software type, like what, what might that look like? Um, you know, let's imagine you have uh, two different types of KMP libraries. Um, in your settings file, you want to be able to say, like give them names. You want to say, okay, I have my legacy libraries. Those are the ones that aren't using Compose. They're using an older version of Kotlin. They're using you know, whatever. Um, I want to be able to set those, and, and, and that's my conventions for the, that type of software. Um, but then I have my, my next gen uh, library, which is going to be using Compose and all the latest features and, and everything else. Um, I can give those things meaningful names. There's still Kotlin, uh, you know, KMP libraries underneath. Um, but in the project build scripts, people pick which one they want, right? They, they can pick a legacy library or a next gen library. Um, but then you start thinking about like, oh, does that mean I need to have like every combination of conventions, I need to give it a different name? And it's like, oh, no, that's not, that's not really what we want. There, there's a, it's slightly a forcing function or slightly good that it's a little hard for you to deviate too much or have too many different types of software because that, that's um, you know, mental load that software developers have to know like, when do I choose this one versus another one? Like in a build where there are like 50 modules, do you really need 15, 50 different build definitions? Like we've seen builds in the wild like that where there is one tiny thing changing between project and this is like spread over everything. But most of the time you don't. Most of the time you should like reduce the number of software types, and that reduced the software developer cognitive overhead. It's like much easier to understand, and you, are, you have to make compromises, of course, but it's much easier to understand. Yeah, and even, even like looking at now in Android, which only has like 50 sub-projects, and the existing um, uh, imperative, declarative, or not declarative, um, Kotlin build scripts, there's a dozen different combinations of plugins and, and things like that, and they're not really necessary. Um, but there are some cases where you have um, some configuration that is maybe shared across uh, different ecosystems. So Compose makes sense in KMP, it makes sense in Android. Um, and so we want to have some way for you to say, at a lower level than the software type, there's some, some conventions that can be carried around and you can kind of just mix those in uh, to the software types as you, as you need them. Um, all right. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to go, Paul? <laughs> so what, what, what we talked about until then is uh, what we've been doing in the past six months and what we have planned in the coming months is. But we uh, would like us to take a step back and see like, where, where we want to go longer term. So getting back to our mission statement, are we not read it again? Uh, it's there. But we want, we want to get there. But we want more. We want, like we said, pluggable mutations, refactorings, and excellent IDE support. And you might be wondering, like, oh, there will be another transition in Grill. Sure. Um, so we're, we're trying to make things easier there. Uh, you can already, with our prototype, you can already mix imperative and declarative in a single build. Uh, the imperative DSL won't go away. And um, like Sterling said, software types will be usable from imperative DSL, meaning that let's say you have a build, uh, an existing build, and you want to progressively 
uh, move to declarative to benefit from that, you can refactor your build script to use the software types, like the modeling aspect of declarative already, and then move to declarative. Uh, and again, like if you have a, a fully declarative build, but you want that, that little flexibility Gradle has that makes it so easy to experiment things in a corner. Like, I open a project and I want to experiment something there, so I want to write code. Just rename the, the, the declarative file to KTS, and then you have Kotlin available. You can prototype your things and then extract that to build logic and switch it back to declarative. So, and we are exploring ways like, like this I just described, but also tooling to help for incremental migration so it, it's, it's easier. Uh, and talking about the future, this, this is a roadmap. It's highly speculative and it's short term, some, some will say. Like this summer, uh, we will be demonstrating what we talked about, like the mutations and, and so on. Uh, and this early access preview will be about getting feedback from the community, like from all of you, uh, from the ID vendors, from the large plug plugin, ecosystem plugin, build builders like the, the Kotlin team, the Android team, and so on, and the larger community. And the second half of the year, we will do more early access previews with more features and addressing all the collected feedback and so on. And we, we, we don't want to like put a roadmap on the screen about what like further because we don't know. So uh, probably adoption, like early adopters could try something on small projects in the second half of the year and maybe start projects, like uh, migrate projects, we'll see. Okay, so uh, this is where we need your help. Um, we have a declaredgradle.org website with a lot of some of the same information and, and things that you can go try or go look at. Um, we've also got a dedicated channel on our community Slack. You can come and join and ask questions or, or find us. Um, there's a link here to uh, the prototypes. They're nothing to look at. They're in, in, in the grand scheme of things, they should all be deleted at some point once all this stuff gets incorporated into Gradle and Android and everything else properly. Um, but we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts and your use cases for um, these kinds of ideas. Um, just yesterday, talking to several people, We've heard other people who are already trying to do something kind of like this, and like they're asking, like, "Oh, is this? Am I on the right path?" And we're like, "Yes." Like, can you please just keep doing that? Yeah. If, um, if you apply our rec existing recommendations to keep your build script declarative and have all your build logic in plugins, you're already set for an, an easy migration in the future because that that's the way things should be. Like the the build logic and the, the software definition clearly separated. Okay. Um, so uh, don't forget to vote. Um, come talk to us at our booth. Um, and uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we're, we're really willing to take some questions now.